Hello, everybody. It's lovely to see you on this Monday morning. Thank you so much for coming out. Is this? Can you guys hear me okay? It's off better. It's on. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us this Monday morning. I'm thrilled. I'm really thrilled. This is now our third grand, third, third grand round of the year, um, and this one it promises to be really exciting because uh, we have actually two star presenters today rather than one. So this is wonderful. We first have uh, we have both Jewel Homko, uh, Dr. Homko, and we have and we also have uh, Chuck Triang. Uh, as a, most of you guys know these folks, but just I want to give you a, a brief overview of their credentials as a way of introduction. Uh, Jewel is um, she's a, a doctor in epidemiology. She did her uh, PhD training in epidemiology at the University of Oklahoma. Prior to that, she got her MPH in St. Louis at St. Louis University with a concentration in epidemiology and biostatistics. Uh, before coming to University of Oklahoma, she served as the uh, health planner for the Tulsa City County Health Department, and in that role, uh, she authored the Tulsa County Health Profile um, for 2010. Now, of course, she's, uh, we're delighted that she is our Director of Research and Community Analytics, and in this role, she uh, oversees our business intelligence team and also helps with, uh, with graduate level education to the, uh, to the medical school. Uh, joining us today also is, doc, is uh, Chuck Trion. He's also a faculty member in the Department of Informatics. Um, he came to us by way of, um, he actually trained in, um, had his BS in uh, Business Administration from the University of Tulsa, uh, and he got his MS in Knowledge Management from the University of Oklahoma. Uh, and he's an incredibly busy gentleman, since he's the project manager for the Oklahoma Primary Healthcare Improvement Collaborative, also known as OVIC for short. And in that role, he manages the AHRQ-funded Evidence Now Healthy Hearts for Oklahoma initiative, the Do No Harm and Pain Opiate Management initiative, um, which is in partnership with the Oklahoma Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. Uh, today, they're going to be talking about a practical application of the OVIC model, real-world dissemination and implementation research. So uh, please help me in uh, welcoming both Chuck and Joel. just going to dive in first, right? Go. And explain, I think maybe the first question is, what is dissemination and implementation research? <laughs> it's usually what a lot of folks ask, right? And so, this is a very busy slide because <laughs> <laughs> it's this simple. I didn't like it. I didn't <laughs> no, but there are, there are a lot of different types of research. Uh, if you start to the left, uh, there's bench science, bench research, so you think about in a lab, maybe testing things in a petri dish, maybe working with animals, uh, and then we, we have findings from that that then we move into research that involves humans, often in very controlled settings, of randomized control trials, very controlled, uh, maybe only among patients of a cer certain age demographic with a certain disease type, and from there, if we with positive findings, we then move into Testing, testing these out in a practice or community setting, uh, in a, again, small scale. Uh, but then we like to move into then applying what we find uh, to the wild, right, in large clinical and community practice. And so what we're doing, dissemination and implementation research, is really studying how we make that translation from things that work on a small scale in a practice or community, community uh, setting to broad scale in an entire community in all, in all practice. And so in our, in our group, so OFIC, which we're gonna, we're gonna describe in more detail, we have two large applied <laughs> dissemination and implementation research projects that we're gonna use as examples throughout the presentation. So we have Healthy Hearts for Oklahoma Project, which was funded by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, ARC, it's a $15 million grant really focused on reduction of cardiovascular events. And then we have Pain and Opioid Management Project, or the POM Project, which is funded by the Oklahoma Department of Mental Health uh, through, a SAM through a SAMHSA grant. And that's really focused on improving pain and opioid management. And both of these projects are focused on primary care practices across Oklahoma. And part of our intervention through OFIC is through both of these projects, we are providing academic detailing, which is peer-to-peer -peer education, so providers going to practices, talking to providers uh, about the guidelines. 
practice facilitation. We have a small army of practice facilitators who go into practices and help them with workflow redesign. Information technology support. We go in and we're really helping these practices understand how to use their EMRs and use the health technology in their practice. Performance feedback. Um, obviously, we, we cannot ask these practices to improve unless we're able to show them how they're currently doing, so we provide performance reports. And then sharing of best practices, so they're up to date on all of the guidelines and um, to help them in their workflow. So who is OFIC? Uh, so OFIC is the Oklahoma Primary Healthcare Improvement Cooperative, and it, it really was, it was established in 2014 um, through that $15 million ART grant. It's housed technically under the Oklahoma Clinical and Translational Science Institute in Oklahoma City. It truly is a collaboration across both campuses. Uh, we work with the Department of Family Medicine in Oklahoma City. We work with the College of Public Health. We work with OCTSI, um, whose role really at OU has been to foster research, so they provide grant management for us. Uh, I'm sure I'm leaving out some departments. We work, we work with a lot of departments across Oklahoma, and we also have a number of state partners. So we work with the Department of Mental Health. We work with the State Health Department. We work with My Health, the Regional Health Information Exchange. Oh, and we're the Department of Medical Informatics, so I think most of you in the audience know that. But we, and you'll see through the presentation, we do a lot uh, in our department to really help uh, with help with all of the OFIC work. Uh, we also partner with the State Health Department. Uh, and OFMQ, I wanted to mention them, they provide uh, a lot of tech technical support with EMRs out in the community. And so OFIC is directed by Dr. Duffy and Dr. Crawford, which Dr. Duffy's in the audience, I said he can correct us as we're presenting and we, if we make any errors in this presentation. Um, and so really we're, we're using those DNI methods, so the five pillars of the academic detailing, pr practice facilitation, uh, IT support, uh, sharing of best practices and performance feedback. We're really using those pillars to improve primary health care across Oklahoma. I'm going to transition. Yeah, so some of you have seen this next presentation, and um, it's a, a very busy process. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through this rapidly. And uh, then what we're going to do is we're going to slow it way down. Because I know when we presented this before, Joel and I did a presentation at a research forum uh, several months back. We went through it, and it's kind of dizzying at times. But what's happened is a lot of people at OFIC have worked on this. Dr. Duffy has been involved in it. Uh, Jewel, others have helped us with this. And what you're seeing is kind of the, the, the external view so far of what OFIC is with those five pillars, those interventions that Jewel was talking about, the research type that we're doing. But there's a method behind our madness. And this is kind of what's behind the curtain. This is our thinking. This is the framework that we operate under. So what we work under is the assumption that there's really three main components to what we're working with. And that is data that's sitting back there. There are processes. What we're really after, the gold standard, if you were, the, the jewel is uh, the actual knowledge of an organization. So the first thing that we have to recognize, and Jewel, the, that, the slide that she was showing earlier that Dr. Nagakali put together and others, Dr. Mould, have, have come up with showing the different kinds of research. This is just one of them. But the whole point of research is to generate new knowledge, to come up with new understandings, things we didn't know before, things that now we can introduce, and to build a base of evidence behind what that knowledge is. What we're looking for is knowledge that initially is generalized. It's just it, it isn't tied to any specific situation. It's things that we know about, but now we've got to find a way to get it out. We've got to get it to other places. And there's different <laughs> studies that have looked at that as to how long that takes. But anybody who's been in primary care knows it takes a long time because docs have to go into practice, they go to conferences, they pick up ideas, they read journals, and change is very slow. What, what we're trying to do is to speed that process up substantially so that deep part of DNI is dissemination. So once we have this knowledge that's generalized, it's nicely structured, it's got to be consistent or it, it's not acceptable. It won't be vetted well. People won't accept it. It's got to be where we can get our hands on it. The real key that comes into this is dissemination. And this is coming out of the uh, knowledge management research of how do you disseminate information. And we find that there's several different strategies that have been used 
over time by different organizations. Uh, one of them is in books and papers. Another one is in uh, classroom settings, formal education, followed up by apprenticeships. And our med school is excellent at providing that kind of dissemination. Then you had, in the real world, uh, mentoring and cross-training. And then lastly, just everyday communications that people go back through and talk to each other. That information then flows down as knowledge transfer mechanisms into our processes. And the processes that we look at here can be known, uh, known by many names. Uh, we, we call them protocols, we call them best practices, we call them workflows. Uh, one of the more uh, current ones that you hear people use today, uh, Dan, you've been uh, really encouraging the use of, um, what's, help me with that term, Dan. There's another type of workflow that uh, another, we didn't know. Pardon me? Swim lanes? Yeah, well, swim lanes is one way to articulate it, but there, there are different names people have for how, what they call their processes that they put in place. Now, where do your processes come from? A lot of influences on it today, especially in healthcare. Payment policies have direct impact on what our policy is going to be in an organization, as is local governance, uh, who's in charge of things, who has authority over different topics in an organization and how we define the roles of what we're going through. Now once we have a process defined, then we can begin to build meaningful measures because if the processes are not consistent, then your data is automatically suspect. So we wind up with uh, measurement specs, we wind up with data definitions, we build dictionaries, uh, we've got people on this team, uh, Jewel uh, has uh, people on her team, Sedina, Carol, that are really good at building this kind of information out so that we wind up with very clear data definitions. Then we move into the data, which is patient health data inside of EHRs, claims, metadata, it comes from many different sources as we put our data together. And the point of all that is to feed into process improvement. We go through an iteration of using lean methods, we use uh, PDSA cycles, you'll hear that very commonly in practices today, of how they do improvements with the whole point of now internalizing the knowledge and making it something that is now organizational or institutional knowledge. And at the same time, it does something else. It starts the process all over again. It feeds new questions back into research. All right, so that's a little bit of a drink from a fire hydrant. What we're going to do is slow it down a bit. What we'll do is take this one piece at a time. And that is, well, what do you mean by knowledge? What does it look like inside of our organization? Jewel, I'll pitch back to you. Okay. So knowledge, uh, I wanted to give a quick example. I don't know if you can transition uh -oh. to the other. Um, so clinicians and providers in general are being bombarded with information in practice. Guidelines are constantly changing. Uh, there's there's just new new information on how they should be practicing. And so again, like Chuck said, we're really trying to speed that process up in terms of helping providers with the latest up-to-date evidence and helping them understand how to implement that into primary care. And so a perfect example from H2O that I pulled was that the, the guidelines for cholesterol management changed from when we applied for H2O and once we were awarded the $15 million grant and we started getting into the practices, from the time we applied and the time we actually went to implement uh, our research mm -hmm. study, the guidelines completely changed. And to show you what these guidelines look like and what providers are being faced with, did you save it? I think you saved it to the desktop. I did, but it's not there. Oh. Okay, so I'm roping that. Yeah. Okay. And again, so these are the latest guidelines for cholesterol management. And you can see here, if you just kind of scroll slowly through this, this is a 120 page document explaining to providers how to identify which patients should be on a statin. Implement that next week. <laughs> right? And this is just cholesterol management. I mean, that's a very small part of, well, I mean, it's a big part, but it's a part of only a, a fraction of the, you know, the different diagnoses and things that they're dealing with in practice, right? So I think just seeing that explains why it's so important. And I think, and Chuck did mention, I think some research, and it's a little outdated, but uh, it's been shown that on average it takes, I think, 17 years for results from randomized control trials to make it into primary care. 
on average. And a piece of that is it took probably 10 years from the time the research in the lab was done and the randomized controlled trials were done until this document was produced. And then it will take about seven years to take this document and put it into workflow processes in the clinician's practice. So. And, and at this moment in time, there are studies ongoing that are questioning the value of managing cholesterol. Yeah, right, the science is <laughs> So you gotta remember, I mean, it's a like continually it's, flowing yeah. river, right? So and that's practice. perfect, yeah. That's exactly this, this workflow, the diagram that Chuck just went through, where we have new knowledge, we're implementing it, we get new data, and that helps us inform us in terms of we have new data and sort of how do we how do we update the evidence to then keep circling through that loop? I would like to have a new iPhone every 17 years. <laughs> <laughs> Those batteries would be really dead. Yeah, so with that in mind, what I wanted to do is just show you then what it is, what we do when we disseminate, and there are a lot of ways that we do dissemination. Uh, but one that's very visible, one that is very popular, is that in all of our projects, we build what are called academic detailer guides, so that when an academic detailer meets peer-to-peer -peer with another clinician. They walk them through an understandable approach to what the evidence is saying. And uh, these academic detailer guides, we have those. We can show those to you. Uh, we actually have them stored out on something called the RPR Exchange. Some of you as researchers have access to that. Uh, we, it'll, it's something that's very attractively built. A lot of effort is put in to professionally show this is what the evidence actually means. And what you see is emphasis all the way through that we're talking about evidence because in a lot of fields there are brand new things that are happening constantly. So we're always having to update these as well as we learn new things. And then what we do is we leave this behind with a clinician, so it's kind of like a mental jog that they can go back to and use as a beginning point. So that's just one form of, uh, of uh, communication and dissemination. Chuck, but, can, yep. can I interrupt the Sure, Dan. Would the, you go back to the further, the first slide? And, and, and yeah, the next one. When we look at this, if you look at all of those items that Chuck has put down there under dissemination, I've come to realize dissemination is a confusing word. <coughs> Classical education is what that is. And if you think about it, most people stop at, at the, at, at before apprenticeship. That almost all education is expected to be, you should be reading this, you should be going to conferences, you should be reading the literature in the papers, and bingo, it'll automatically happen. And what we've learned is nothing could be further from the truth. That educa formal education is very important for novices coming into a field. Right. It is somewhat useless for people who are already in the field and are working daily, day in and day out. Now, when I started out in medical education, apprenticeships were really totally unorganized, completely random. They were internships and residencies. They are now standardized. That's happened over the past 30 years. The idea of cross-training, mentoring, and deliberate communications is truly brand new. It's part of the, I think it's the social media world. And we are now paying close attention to how is the communication coming to people as a form of disseminating new information, as well as taking staff in a physician's office and making sure that the receptionist is cross-trained to understand what the blood pressure means and, and so on. Well, and, and more than that, there are people in the knowledge management world that believe that of all of those, of those six that are up there, communication is the most important one, because that's where people are just talking to each other. It may be at a conference, it may through, be through some informal structure, but that's where it's less intimidating and people are able to interact more. There's more of an exchange that happens, and we encourage that in all of our projects, every one of those forms of facilitation, of dissemination, we are using very deliberately in our OFIC projects. And you would see each one of those as an example. Uh, so beyond dissemination, uh, we've got a lot of uh, different dissemination uh, packets like that. Once we've gone through it, just to give you an idea, this is one of the newer forms that we've got of documenting our processes. So when we go in and meet with the practice, we're getting ready to help them with this program called Do No Harm. 
and do no harm is really the opioid uh, education for the practice. And after sorting through the evidence, and to give credit where it's due, Dr. Duffy distilled that down to 21 what he called target strategies. And we put this in front of a practice, often to the senior leadership. And that's where we really want to see this, the senior clinical leadership. And what we point out to them is, you can't do all this at one time. It's overwhelming. So which of these do you want to work on? And they'll identify the targets. They give us their priorities. Well, that's the first step. Then we go beyond that, and we've created kind of a generic best practice that if you're going to do this one, this is what you might ought to be doing. Here's some good ideas that we've learned from other places that are consistent with the evidence that's there. You're going to see an extension of this a little bit later on. We'll keep building on that. All right, Jewel, this is your world. <laughs> and then data. <laughs> so we are collecting in all of our projects an enormous amount of data. And here's sort of a high-level overview of some of the things we're collecting. Uh, we have an electronic practice record. That's where we're really tracking the dose, the frequency, duration, the type of intervention. So every interaction that we have with a practice, we're tracking what was the interaction, what did we help the practice with, what were the questions they may have had, uh, and sort of how long was our phone call, how long, you know, all sorts of things. And the administrative also, the time that it's taking to travel to these practices, just the details of every interaction. So we can kind of look at what was our intervention so later we can tease out did that intervention have an effect, right? And then we also, every practice that is enrolled in one of our projects completes a practice characteristic survey at least once, if not many times. And this is a, I don't know, Carol probably knows on top of her head, maybe 30, 40 page survey, something like that? Um, maybe that long. Okay, maybe not quite that long. But we're really asking, every, there's one survey per practice asking about practice demographics, who works in their practice, uh, what does their ownership look like, uh, where are they located, their electronic health record information, so what EMR system do they have, how long have they had it, what functionalities do, does their EMR have, and then strategies that their practice is currently using to improve cardiovascular care or pain and opioid management, depending on what the project is. And then every member in the practice, so all of the providers, the office staff, front desk, everyone in the practice completes a practice member survey. So you can imagine we have, I think for the H2O study, oh, I know there were over 4,000 practice member surveys that we had collected. So roles, we ask each individual about their role in the practice, how many hours they work, how many years they've worked there, uh, their perceptions of the work environment, and we try to get a sense of their provider, their knowledge of the evidence-based guidelines and how much they agree or disagree with those guidelines. And currently, we're collecting, we've built all of those surveys into REDCap, which is an online tool that we could build surveys in there. And then actually, and we found, we, we thought all these practices would go online and complete their surveys naively five years ago. <laughs> and then we, we learned that a lot of these rules, because we're really focused a lot on small and medium-sized practices across Oklahoma with a strong emphasis on rural Oklahoma. And so a lot of these practices, we were shocked that many of them do not have stable internet connection. And so them logging into REDCap just was not feasible. They, we tried it for a while, they would get halfway through the survey, lose internet connection, have to start over. Uh, so we're doing a lot on paper, and then that small army of practice facilitators then has to come back to their office and uh, enter the data into REDCap. We're also collecting, do you want to say something about the lesson? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things just to point out. Why are we doing the surveys? Because I got to ask that question just last week. Why are you collecting a survey with all these questions when this is a pain and opioid management program? It's because not only are we trying to improve those targets, we're also working on practice change. What are the things that facilitate a practice? What are its characteristics that make it a candidate to do improvement? And what are the things that get in the way of it? And another thing I've just, you know, kind of jumps out at me every time we go through this. We mentioned this is a cooperation, a collaboration with Oklahoma City in uh, what they do there. Uh, we've got specialties up here. 
Uh, we've got people like Carol and, and the work that she does around building these red cap surveys that is non-trivial. And she can put these together and we can roll those out to the field. And Oklahoma City's really become dependent upon that kind of work that we're doing. So it really has become a very nice partnership that's there. So in addition to um, the data I just described, we're also collecting a number of performance measures. So for H2O, for example, we collected sort of uh, aspirin use, these are standard NQF endorsed measures, blood pressure control, so among all of the patients in their practice that have hypertension, what proportion of them have their hypertension under control, their blood pressure under control, uh, cholesterol management, which you sort of talked about, uh, smoking cessation counseling and intervention, so really looking at everyone 18 years of age and older in your practice, what proportion of them have you provide, uh, have you screened for smoking, and if they were positive for smoking, have you provided intervention? So really, so again, tracking, you cannot improve on something if you're not tracking sort of how you're doing to begin with. So these are things we're collecting quarterly, I think, in all of our projects. And then the POM performance measures, uh, so pain and opioid management, this is actually a really novel area uh, where there are not defined measures here. And so Dr. Duffy's done a lot of work. We've really been looking at uh, really taking a lead in the country on how, what are the measures that practices should be tracking in order to monitor how they're doing with pain and opioid management. And so these are just an example. We're looking at the number of chronic pain patients in a practice based on a bunch of ICD-10 codes. And then among those with chronic pain, what proportion of them have had a pain assessment during the previous year? And we're looking at what proportion of those with a chronic pain diagnosis have had been screened for alcohol, drug use, depression, uh, and, and then also just looking at chronic pain patients being prescribed chronic opioid therapy, because obviously we're wanting to see some of that de decrease. Uh, and so these are just a few of the measures. There's many more. Uh, but it's some, there's it feels, it feels like 48. <laughs> no, but it's been, and one of the challenges too is trying to marry the what we think we should be tracking with what is actually possible given some of these EMR systems. And that's something we're learning a lot about and we've been able to sort of uh, really talk about nationally in terms of what should you be tracking versus EMR capabilities. And again, uh, I think what Chuck was alluding to, it's very important that we're tracking all of this data because all of that demographic data, it's sort of, that's the only way we can look at what are characteristics of practices or practice members? How, are, how is that associated with a practice that improves on some of these versus doesn't improve? And so being able to tease out those differences uh, is really important, but we have to collect the data. Do, do you have any conclusion you're willing to share with the group? No. Any character? Well, I'll what? give you one. The practices that are able to improve more consistently are the SOBO, you know, small practices and practices that are owned by the clinician. Those that have more difficulty are those that are owned by health systems. The reason that we have OFMQ and my health list at the bottom, uh, those of you who have had any work at all in healthcare data, it's very complicated to get. Uh, it doesn't come out easily. You can't just go get it out of the EHR like you would think it is. It's a very difficult process. So we work with our partners, my health to help us pull the data. We also work with OFMQ, who goes into the practice, either shows the practice how to capture their data better, or actually pulls it from the EHR and gets it to us. So there's a lot of work that goes into that as well, just getting to these performance measures. So the, the whole point of what we're doing is to try to get to process improvement. And uh, there's a lot of discussion about how to do that uh, in, in the field. But I want to show you some examples. This goes back to pain and opioid management. These are screenshots coming out of that electronic practice record, which is something that Dr. Duffy and Zolt Nagakaldi really came up with as a unique idea when they were uh, working on the original H2O project. Originally, it was something that we were doing uh, through spreadsheets and became very complicated to carry that off. We were using SharePoint to capture it, translating it over into spreadsheets. It was quite a pain. We've now moved this into RedCap is where we have this today. And so what happens is of those different goals that a practice would have, then they identify for us which ones they want to target. And once they've identified the target, we break it down to specifically what do you want to work on. 
But the part that I like the most is, then it's left up to the facilitator as they get to know the practice, exactly which of these steps are you gonna take them through? And most of you that have been around any of the lean processes, these are, this is pulled from the DMAIG model. Now there's discussion about whether it should be DMAIG or DMAV, it really doesn't matter. As long as the facilitator now has a formal structure that they're gonna go in with. So they, before they even go into the practice, know the kind of things that they're gonna work on. Then what we do is we push it back out to the practice in the form of dashboards. And we love dashboards. And we've got quite a team here in Tulsa that have become expert. Uh, uh, we've got Tone and Jim and Carol working together to produce these dashboards almost automatically now, where we can feed this back to the practice. One of the things that we've learned about uh, measures is not only for the measure to be useful, it has to be meaningful to the clinician as well. And we've really struggled coming up with it. Now, I will tell you in the pain and opioid management, and Dr. Duffy as an academic detailer can reinforce, uh, the docs are interested because some of these measures are very meaningful to other people, uh, especially the people that run the PDMP. They don't want to get in trouble with that, so they're very careful around that. So we built our dashboards, and we started all over again. Once we're through with that, we feed the research information in, we come up with new questions, and we start it up all over again. So what's next? So really, I mean, this is sort of the framework we've developed with H2O. We've been able to leverage to obviously expand to the Palm Project now. And these are just a few examples of a number of st small studies or medium-sized studies, large studies, across Oklahoma that have been using the framework that we've built through OFIC to do DNI work. And so they just keep going. It's, it's really great to see. We hope it just keeps going. Yeah. And so, and we do have a, you know, we have a, a, we've only highlighted two of probably our largest studies right now, but we also have a study going on with the State Health Department. Uh, we have a second project with the Department of Mental Health that we didn't That's talk right. about, and we did apply for another $3 million art grant over Christmas uh, that looks very promising to look at unhealthy alcohol use. And so, we just keep expanding That's what, it what goes. we're doing. By the way, that's what we do. Questions? <laughs> the experts on that are in the room. <laughs> so I, I have one question I would ask. Um, as you guys know, and maybe not everybody in the room knows, but our department um, mission is to help achieve a learning health system in Oklahoma. And um, I wonder how this fits into getting us to a learning health system. Well, I, I think the very, the, the in-person, one-on-one education with clinicians is a tremendous part of that. I think then when the facilitator goes in and it's got a specific topic with templates, with workflows to help them the practice learn, the practice learning I think is very high. I think where the challenge is now, how do we bring this back into our formal education system? There was a grant that we saw just recently about how do you bring uh, certain skills like this into uh, the medical uh, education process or a couple of grants underway on that. Uh, I don't know that we've addressed that yet, but I know we've talked about it. I know that's an issue out there, but our real focus has been educating in primary care to make sure that we can implement more cleanly. I also think our ability, uh, what we've built with the BI team in terms of collecting enormous amounts of data and nearly returning it back to the practices in real time is crucial for a learning healthcare system. Well, and papers are already yeah. starting to come out of this process. That's another part of that dissemination process. So okay. David, there, they, that's really a great question because there are uh, two big ideas that have come out of this work. One big idea is called the um, Oklahoma Primary Healthcare Extension System. That's and it's based on a very old idea. A very old idea meaning it's 102 years old. And it was based on the idea that to improve the food productivity in the United States, which was taking about 80% of the population to deliver 4% of the needed food, something like that. Everybody was in food production. The way to improve food production was to take the research from the universities, 
create a whole lot of agricultural and mining universities to develop the research and then get that research out to the farmers in practice by developing county extension agencies. Jim Bold's idea was do that for healthcare. That's how you compress this and build an extension system for healthcare. Well, 100 years has changed a lot in, in our world. First of all, we produce more food than we consume by about three times uh, in the United States. So it's been an extraordinarily successful But we really try to consume it all. Yeah, and now we are trying to consume more of it. They have healthcare problems that need to solve. Right. <laughs> but then we come up with evidence and we just the, yeah. the, second, the second big idea is one that came to me a number of years ago when um, David Leach asked me to come up with an idea on the next residency program, the pro residency program accreditation program after the next one. So think two <laughs> times ahead. And I gave a presentation that said it's all about cybernetics. That was before the word learning organization had developed. And I said we must have a continuous feedback loop that feeds back performance to the people who are performing and has an input valve so that new information can come in to change that performance cycle. And that's what Chuck has shown you here. Chuck and Jewel have shown you. We've tested and it works. The flaw in it right at the moment, <clears throat> the big flaw in it right at the moment is data. In order to provide feedback, you have to have meaningful data to feedback. Timely data too. Pardon me? Timely as well. And timely, it's gotta be timely and it's gotta be useful. It's gotta be actionable. Uh, and believe it or not, those are concepts that are quite foreign to our culture right at the moment. People like data for data's sake. There are a number of people in the room who fit into that category. Uh, there, there are people who hate data. But the data is the cybernetic driver that allows a self-organizing system to keep on target. We are using cybernetics to get in deep space exactly where we want to go, hundreds of millions of years to light years, and we're using it in other fields, but we haven't learned how to use it in the changing of human behavior when the human behavior is clinical medicine providing care to people. So I think that's where we're going in a learning organization, and learning organization in, in my mind is the catchphrase for that kind of process going on in human uh, work. Leanne, you had a question, I think. So, um, you want to speed up the process, shorten that 17 years. Um, you've got these different types of dissemination, and Dr. Duffy you know, said communications is kind of the biggie. How do you keep it from the knowledge becoming anecdotal or assumption based versus evidence Great. and research based? You know, you kind of get that ball rolling, then does it? Do you fear, and if you do fear, how do you mitigate that becoming a runaway train? So, and it's a really good question, and we really have that with pain and opioid management. Uh, House Bill 1446 came out, what, a year ago? And already there's amendments to it, and there are discussions about how they're going to change. So I think one of the things you have to build into this is with the evidence material, there has to be constant reevaluation of it. That's where the new questions come up. Once you put something in place, you begin to look at the data and realize that just didn't work like we thought it was going to, or it's breaking down. New questions, drive new research, the process starts back up again. But there's another one. We were building a budget process sometime back about how do we sustain pain and opioid management over time. And I remember one of the things we did is we looked at what's the life cycle of this. And after about three years, maybe four years, a lot of the people who made the change to make it positive, a lot of them go on to other jobs, they forget what they learned, they fall back into old habits. You almost need to come back in and restart the process again. So I think it's a never-ending learning process, which means we've got to keep looking at what our data is telling us today and how do we improve upon it. Uh, that's a couple of the things that just come to mind. There's also um, a ranking of levels of quality evidence. Cochrane is one of those. And um, so in the original POM programs that Family Medicine put together, there was always an evidence ranking. So when you would choose to base a change or an intervention on something, you could know what level of evidence was behind it. Um, 
but um, there are plenty of uh, questions that remain about you know, study design and size, and, and so I, I really think that this, um, Dan, every time you say cybernetics, I keep thinking L. Ron Hubbard for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody use a different no. term. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, the, this sort of, um, you know, building on the living flow of information and, and con continually tuning and cleaning up the quality of that data and evidence so that you can um, base it on your own experience and resources and not just the, the you know, five, ten years away what's in the medical literature and it's going to be important. So, so we're in a new world uh, and your question is spectacular. When I started in this game in the 60s and 70s, our exchange of information, our standard was our local community hospital and our medical staff and we'd talk about it and we'd exchange information, people would read something and so on. Your world is completely different. Our world is completely We have social media. We have tweets, Twitters, Facebook, that we have everything. We have the internet, which is as filled with falsehood as it is true. And I remember, again, 30 years ago, when a good friend of mine, Frank Davidoff, who was uh, editor of the Annals of Internal Medicine, gave a presentation about knowledge refinery. And he said the purpose of journals is not to disseminate knowledge, but it is actually to declare what is knowledge from the chaff of what is simply information that has not been uh, organized. And Chuck has a really good model there of what are the characteristics of knowledge, generalizable, structured, accessible. What we don't have right now in the internet, and we're having a lot of struggle with it, who is the editor? Right. And knowledge is based on an editorial function, which is a social function made up of peer reviewers, of editorial boards, of policy, knowledge policy makers. Now, the editors, you know, after the printing press was invented, there was a lot of crap put up. They were called flyers. They were, they were the tweets of the 15th century. Uh, but now, uh, and we have that, we have that today. We are always in search of the editors. And so the medical journals still, re still have that position of editorial function, of trying to sort out fact and fiction. Is it good? Is it a perfect process? Absolutely not. And that's what makes it so exciting. Because the best data that comes out of applying something in practice is what's actually able to be done in the practice. And do patients get better in the wild state rather than just in the randomized control state? So I've been looking for a place to plug this in. Another vision Jim had was to continue the relationship that we're building with all these primary care physicians. Uh, they're all over the state. They're not just here in the metropolitan areas, a lot of them around the rural areas. And he had a, he had a vision to build uh, something that today we call the RPR exchange. And what that is, is it's, he is a curator of what's in all the journals, trying to bring out the best stuff, put it in a single place so that Docs and researchers could not only go find that, but could engage in meaningful conversation about it. It's not going over very well. We're getting very little traction on that. Uh, very few people are signing up for it. Very few people are enacting. It's almost forced to make it work. And whenever I talk to clinicians, they just, they don't have time. Their, their statement is, I'm already overwhelmed with so many different reading services, I don't have time for one more, and it's really struggling. So, you know, that kind of helps make the point that it's really difficult to bring that into, a, uh, into the real world today uh, as a reading service. We're going to have to find something different, and I don't know what that difference 17 is. 17 years. 17 years, we'll know how to do that. <laughs> so I have a theory on that. Um, I think the, the one of the big challenges, uh, I mean, the, the challenges facing clinicians are you get the product of somebody's maybe two, two and a half years of work is maybe five or six years of work provided to you in a fairly dense, maybe accurate and evidence-based, but fairly dense format 
that is different from everything else in your world today, right? It doesn't come in Facebook with pictures. It doesn't come in USA Today with a big infographic on it. It's not been, it's not very digestible at all. And the skills needed to critically assess the medical literature, um, you know, on the one hand, take time and maintenance, and that's something you don't get when you're out, out in practice. And they also take um, uh, a healthy dose of skepticism. So, so now, now what we're saying is, your very best source of evidence is in the published literature that, that has been through editorial review boards, been peer reviewed, and you should be critical of it and try to decide whether to believe it or not. I really feel like, you know, if we're going to get to um, learning health system, uh, then what we need to be doing is is bringing the da the, the methods you describe here, like the dashboards built on living data from that very practice, or 10,000 practices like that one, to the surface. So that at some point, you can imagine um, in a computer somewhere, in a processor somewhere, um, a patient comes to see me today and I document that there's a rash with this particular medication. And it just so happens that when that data flows into the system, uh, that that's now one rash, that one new rash observation was enough to, to trigger a statistically significant uh, rate of reactions to this medication, which now becomes a potential complication which will appear tomorrow morning when I try to prescribe that medication again. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, how do we, that to me is the bar we need to set and we need to be thinking about our information systems and the structure of the architecture of them, the flow of data, the governance and the policy around that data to achieve that goal rather than how do we perpetuate the sort of old, um, you know, very useful but, but sort of old and slower processes we have in editorial review um, that are just not going to be able to get us there. We're not going to. We're not. We're never going to fly if we don't get the combustion engine and the airfoil built, right? So, there's a question in the back. I guess so. If you're talking about the 17 years it takes for research, to actually have the practices, but when you're talking about the time constraints, when you're talking about human behavior and different factors, the information is being disseminated, but it's still not being. It's still not actionable, and so that guide of 17 years is really not accurate. It's really not a good picture because the information is available, but unless the, the physicians, the practices acting on it. That's really the key the to, of yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And the key is though dissemination and implementation. Right. And that unless right. someone is there to help walk the practice through it, and the more that they do that, I mean, our facilitators develop, anyone that's involved in that field gains a lot of experience. And they begin to see things, and they're able to bring the knowledge from one practice into another one. But you're right, just telling people is not enough. And if that's all this was, with just a dissemination strategy, it's probably not going to be very effective. But dissemination and implementation is really the key to that. And I think then we can start to make some headway. And we've seen that. We've seen it in the H2O project. We're seeing it. We're better at it with the Do No Harm, the Pain and Opioid Management Program. We're going to keep getting better at how do we not only disseminate, how do we implement that knowledge. That's a great observation. Yeah, your question is right on target. And in Chuck's diagram of knowledge, process, and data, you're talking about process. If we learn our processes, and when you begin to look at how do doctors and clinics and practices develop those processes. It's organic. They are not planned and structured. Only recently are we beginning to plan and structure them as we've learned from Henry Ford developing the assembly line, which is not a very good model to put into, into healthcare. But we just <coughs> learned medicine, got our diploma, and then went out and started doing it. That's honestly where medicine started. We are now focusing on process as the work of a group of people who are doing regular systematic things every time, all the time, that they know is going to achieve an outcome for the patient. Oh, and by the way, we measure it, that's where the data comes in, to see whether or not we're deceiving ourselves or whether it's real. Implementation is the science of changing the work processes. Guess what? Most of the practices we keep go into are like the fish swimming in water. They say, what's water? When we say, what's a work process? Well, we don't know what a work 
process is. We just do it. Right. And that's what we're beginning to change. For 17 years, we started doing that. Yeah, I mean, about 30 years.